Hey, so what is Fluence? What are you building? Whoa. Uh, hello. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that's uh, such a direct question uh, from the first seconds. Well, um, Fluence is a protocol, and Fluence is a network uh, that uh, implements uh, cloudless paradigm and cloudless concepts, uh, which are pretty new. So today I want to explain the main parts, like conceptual parts of a, a Fluence Protocol Foundation uh, that makes it uh, different and that makes it uh, like maybe fit for some specific use cases, especially uh, related to the pin. So um, can I share the screen? You can. Uh, there, is, uh, there is an article uh, that's on... Uh, the Fluence uh, documentation website. And uh, uh, I will be just explaining the meaning of uh, uh, the text. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions, I I can answer. OK, cool. So first of all, uh, Fluence uh, is a network of many compute peers. And these peers are actually running on different hardware on different servers. And uh, uh, in the real world uh, that we have, uh, these servers are owned by some people or organizations. So we have different compute providers which operate these hardware. Uh, and uh, uh, we are, like we, the Fluence, uh, we enable an off-chain cloudless experience. So there is no blockchain. I mean. There is a blockchain for compute marketplace as a kind of control plane above this hardware, mm -hmm. but the computation that Fluence enables is off-chain, okay, which is kind so, of tricky. So the machines that are running these things are similar to what you would find in one of the commercial, uh, the big commercial entities like cloud providers, et cetera, but you're doing it in a, de in a decentralized way and you're using the blockchain just to coordinate the machines. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Okay, cool. So right now we have uh, uh, a few uh, uh, launch partners, uh, compute providers, uh, which uh, uh, operate their own data centers and they join their hardware to the Fluence network by registering uh, to the compute marketplace, uh, which is on chain. Uh, and uh, in order to have uh, the, like, uh, to not compete for the block size uh, with uh, different projects, uh, we have our own small uh, blockchain with a, which is restricted just to the compute marketplace. It has nothing else and you cannot deploy anything else there, just the marketplace. But uh, blockchains is uh, what, uh, what is around for many years and it's not uh, that novel to have a blockchain with compute marketplace. Uh, what I want to speak about is uh, this off-chain part of a Fluence network and Fluence protocol. So what is the main difference? The main difference is that in uh, uh, the blockchain, we have many machines uh, performing the same state transition. So it means that there is uh, uh, the lower boundary of uh, uh, the capabilities of the machine so that it's able to run uh, the code or uh, it's able to have the proper uh, state required to compute the state transition for the next block. But uh, fundamentally, uh, they all are the same. Uh, they perform the same job, which is super expensive and so on. Right. So there you mean like uh, they're all running some, for example, Ethereum client, which has effectively the exact same functionality. And it's usually pretty simple functionality that's just about managing state of, of the Ethereum chain, if we're talking Ethereum. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, for uh, Cloudless, uh, we have different hardware and uh, this hardware might be doing different jobs. And it might differ in capabilities, which might be important for uh, the user, for, for the developers. So um, this means that uh, 
if we want to implement something that uh, replaces the cloud experience with a, a more decentralized approach, uh, we need to solve a lot of specific problems, which are uh, like more, which are closer to uh, the clouds uh, than they're close to the blockchain space. So, uh, first of all, if some peers are ready to serve the job and others are not, for example, some peers have the required capability, or uh, we have our code prepared on some peers and not on others, or we prefer one region or another region, and so on. We need to find these peers. Uh, we need to find the route to these peers and then instruct them to execute some, some job. Uh, and uh, there is a difference in the execution strategy that we might employ. So in the blockchain, it's consensus. Uh, everything you can do is uh, just replicated. Uh, if you're using the read model on the blockchain, usually it's more or less centralized. You get to some uh, RPC node like... Uh, Alchemy or something like that. Yeah, uh, but here uh, we cannot say that this or that way to call uh, uh, the function called the job is uh, the only appropriate way to call the job. We want to be flexible on that. So if you want consensus, we want to enable consensus. If you want fault tolerance, we want to enable fault tolerance. Uh, if you want uh, like to build an Oracle and have a key of N, uh, responses or signatures or something like that, that also also should be possible. So can I ask you now, um, what would be like a just really simple example of a function that you would want to deploy in this, this uh, off-chain compute model? Like what's a very simple use case? Well, um, we can think of uh, uh, Web2 and uh, Web2 related and Web3 related uh, use cases. Uh, it could be like uh, model inference, uh, it could be uh, oracles, uh, it could be uh, user data, replicated user data, and reading, writing to this user data, uh, user own data, and such things. One of the examples uh, that I like and uh, uh, that we have is uh, uh, FRPC, Fluence RPC, uh, which does uh, the oracle on top of uh, Ethereum nodes so that you can decide uh, whether you want to call many nodes for the single response or you want to get to one node to, to many and it's very pluggable mm -hmm. so uh, so this is too like sort of thing uh, you put in a serverless function but you're just you're trying to you're like expanding this idea of serverless into something decentralized then, right? Yeah, um, I think that cloudless cloudless is a, a new term, but and it has many definitions. And one of the definitions is uh, that it's a decentralized serverless. So uh, what is serverless usually used for? Uh, usually it's used to organize some compute uh, or organize data tra transformations inside the boundaries of uh, the cloud deployment. So you have different services, uh, maybe managed services or uh, the ones that you deploy on your own. And uh, uh, you have the serverless function, which finds these services, the instances which fit for, for this particular request and connects some inputs to outputs here. So uh, to enable similar experience, but without introducing the cloud, we have three concepts. Uh, it's cloudless function, compute function, and managed effects. So I want to give a few words about each one and uh, how Fluence approaches uh, this or that problem. And it's like the main things to understand uh, uh, what Fluence is and what it's uh, capable for. Uh, so speaking about the cloudless function, uh, for serverless, 
it's uh, pretty possible to to have a single coordinator. Usually, uh, you have a single machine uh, which gets the request from the user or like an event, and that it uh, organizes uh, the flow, the workflow uh, to handle this request. So if you think about uh, uh, step functions, usually there is some coordinator inside. Uh, if you want to have decentralization and uh, to have decentralized serverless, then uh, there should be no single coordinator. It should be possible to avoid this uh, uh, bottleneck and this uh, point of failure so that uh, we can make a really distributed and decentralized flow uh, to protect from censorship and so on and so forth. So for that, uh, we have cloudless functions. Cloudless functions are distributed, uh, coordinator-free choreography uh, that goes from peer to peer uh connecting outputs to inputs for some compute functions which are located on these peers mm -hmm. uh, so yeah direct analogy is uh, uh step functions main difference is that uh in cloudless functions we have no coordinator no single peer that serves it so and step functions is uh, an amazon web services concept right yeah, 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 it's uh, from AWS. Yeah. So in AWS, they have Lambda functions, uh, which uh, are executed on a single machine, and step functions that uh, let you connect many uh, Lambda functions inside your deployment. So right. here so we have like a pipeline or a workflow. Yeah. yeah. So with the cloudless function is this pipeline or workflow uh, in this medium of uh, Fluence network of different peers on different compute providers. So you can take all of this into account if you want. Uh, and uh, uh, for cloudless functions, uh, we created Aqua. Aqua is a language uh, uh, that is uh, designed for these distributed workflows, a language and the runtime. And uh, uh, Aqua runtime, Aqua VM is actually the heart of uh, uh, Fluence uh, protocol. It's an analogy to the uh, blockchain's state machine, but this is not the chain. Uh, the state of the Aqua execution is not the chain, it's a graph. And uh, the state uh, that happens during, that occurs during execution, uh, forms a kind of uh, CRDT uh, structure, conflict-free, uh, data type, uh, and uh, it includes a lot of uh, guarantees and uh, like all the signatures, uh, uh, all the code can be, all the data can be traced. You know uh, who provided this or that value to your compute function, uh, how it uh, was created, from what it uh, it was derived. So um, it's also probably pretty unique, but Aqua is a new language. So we have some guarantees that we need to provide uh, in order to enable developers rely on these uh, cloudless functions. Uh, with these guarantees, we have some limitations because uh, uh, you cannot just have something absolutely for free. Usually, usually you cannot. And uh, uh, there are from some flexibility benefits uh, that you have if you're using Aqua. So the main uh, guarantees are convergence. Uh, you can use true parallelism. So you can uh, have the fork and join pattern and uh, uh, you can have the same job executed on different peers in parallel, or you can have different jobs executed on in different branches of uh, uh, the workflow on different peers. And then you can join, and when you join, uh, you will not have a conflicting state. So you will know what, what variable uh, resolves to what exactly. And uh, uh, it comes with uh, the audit log. So uh, 
there is a trace of what exactly peer does what exactly and why. Like, if uh, a peer misbehaves uh, in the most situations, uh, you can use uh, the conflicting state. If you got to conflicting state, you can use it as a proof of a uh, uh, misbehavior, like what exact mm. peer did something right. wrong. Because when you're building something like this, one of the things that's easy to forget if, if you're not the one building it uh, is you're not just building a system like you would in a centralized world where you you can trust <clears throat> trust every actor on the network to be doing the right thing because you own the machines. So you, what you're talking about here is ways to ensure that decentralized anonymous compute providers are not doing something incorrect, right? Because that's always been to, to me like the hardest thing to figure out uh, for doing this sort of decentralized general compute is you've got randos on the internet running machines and you have to be able to trust that they're actually running the code that you want. Of course, then you also have humans deploying code uh, to these machines and you need to trust that they're not doing something malicious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, we, we have many different approaches to this uh, problem. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, this is just one uh, one part of it because uh, if we begin dissolving the, the problem of security of uh, distributed code execution on the open network, then we have much more than just the state transition inside a single request, and uh, uh, it it becomes uh, much 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 harder to figure out what's wrong. But uh, let's go step by step. Uh, like when we have the, the concepts, uh, maybe we will have some time to speak about security. Okay. Uh, yeah. So convergence, state convergence, audit execution, you have signatures, uh, and all the data is signed. Uh, then we have some limitations. Uh, one is that aqua, the language, uh, only fits for choreography. So if you need some compute, especially some extensive or custom compute, you need to delegate this compute to compute functions. So we have this segregation, uh, separation of concerns. Uh, cloudless function is a distributed flow. Compute function is uh, solving the problem of compute on a single peer. Like, uh, and it actually helps design-wise. So is it fair to say that Aqua is a domain-specific language for orchestration or choreography of uh, cloudless compute? Yes, yes. Yeah. It was designed only for this for, for, for this problem in mind, uh, and all the decisions, including like a type system, or syntax, uh, are uh, made to make the language best fit for this problem. Cool. And, and it was actually you that, that made these decisions, right? You're the one that created Aqua? Well, yes, uh, I created Aqua. I implemented the first uh, Aqua compiler. Uh, and uh, uh, the main ideas, like not the main, some ideas behind the Aqua virtual machine runtime are also mine. Uh, but uh, Fluence Protocol is a collective effort and uh, a lot of pieces would be not possible without people who were involved creatively with all the passion and uh, implementing them. Right. Yeah. Of course, it's a it's a collective. I'm just I'm always curious uh, if if my life had taken a different path. I think one of the top alternate uh, professions I would have had is being a real language nerd and creating compilers and languages. So I'm uh, always envious when I meet people who followed through with that. Um, and therefore, I will ask one more nerdy question about the language before I let you move on, which is just um, like, what languages were your inspiration when you were creating Aqua? Um, and you know, what languages did you love or do you love now other than Aqua? Um, yeah, awesome question. Um, it was a uh, um, Elm. Uh, Elm language. I uh, enjoy its uh, how lightweight the Elm code looks uh, mm -hmm. when you see it. Uh, I enjoy when uh, the 
lines are short and uh, uh, like you, you see a lot of ear in, in the code. Another language is uh, uh, Unison. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a distributed language for a cloud uh, compute and uh, uh, it solves a very different problem, uh, but in a similar domain. And uh, I was looking uh, on it as well. Another language is uh, uh, Scala, especially the third version of uh, Scala. So I would say that these three languages are the main sources of inspiration. And so, speaking about uh, what language I love right now, unfortunately, I tend to write code less and less uh, as I have uh, more and more uh, work uh, for like as a CTO. Uh, but uh, I really value the like the decisions made in Rust are excellent, outstanding. Mm -hmm. It's very beautiful, and I began understanding how beautiful Rust language is only when I was building the compiler. Uh, and uh, I was facing different decisions, design decisions. And it's always uh, the question of uh, um, the workload, like how much time will it take to implement this or that function versus uh, clarity and beauty and so on. And it feels like in Rust, they found a wonderful path for all of these decisions, especially given that when you're making one decision, it indirectly affects some other decision down the road. Uh, and you need to have both in mind when you, you're making them, even if the, the, the lateral decision is not yet made, even if it's too early to think about it, you still need to have it in mind. So Rust is definitely amazing. And uh, I still uh, like uh, uh, Scala 3. Uh, it's uh, very powerful and probably it's uh, the language where I'm the most productive when I'm coding. Yeah, so all of these are like really pragmatic sort of semi-hybrid fu functional first languages, usually with strong typing yeah. and great type systems. Yeah, yeah, we, we share this in common. Awesome. Yes. Okay, I'm done interrupting you with this this uh, sidetrack here. Uh, so let's get back to uh, to Aqua. Uh, we have guarantees. We have limitations. Uh, one is that is for choreography. Another important limitation is that uh, probably if you want to see some algorithm, uh, you need to implement it yourself because Aqua is a very young language. And uh, yes, it fits. Maybe maybe fits the best for expressing such algorithms. Like you can express Kademlia on Aqua, and once you did it, uh, you don't need to. Like it's uh, it doesn't enforce the languages of your peers. You can implement the peer on a very different language or on, mm -hmm. in many languages. So you have it detached. Uh, or uh, uh, you can have many different versions of, for example, Kademlia on the same network without the need to redeploy the peers. And uh, these capabilities are kind of nice. But the drawback is that today we don't have Kademlia implemented in Aqua. So, mm. so that's homework for some viewer then. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, speaking about... Uh, Flexibility, uh, one uh, benefit or like thing is that uh, it uh, stands on strong foundation. Uh, when we were thinking about uh, what model should we take uh, for uh, Aqua, for the Aqua execution model, we were thinking like there are many bright minds around uh, who are very sophisticated in distributed algorithms. And uh, instead of uh, thinking what exact algorithm should be used, let's enable them to uh, make any algorithm they need. And for that, we need to have a set of instructions, which is enough to implement something distributed 
that we even cannot imagine yet. And for that, we took uh, Pi calculus, uh, and that's the main uh, foundation uh, for distributed logic uh, in uh, Aqua. Uh, in Pi calculus, you have something around eight primitives, and uh, Aqua compiles to uh, Aqua intermediate representation, uh, low level language, which has something around 14 instructions, and most of them are just corresponding uh, to, to Pi calculus. Which means that whatever you can imagine, highly likely uh, you can implement in Aqua. Uh, and uh, yeah, we have this uh, benefit that if you or anyone uh, implemented uh, any algorithm, any execution strategy, like this uh, way of hand failover or that way, load balancing and so on, uh, it can be reused, worked, uh, made to fit your needs and so on. So uh, very pluggable, very flexible. So you imagine if we fast forward several years, there will, there will be a rich library of Aqua functions for all the sort of basic distributed systems things that everyone wants to do. Yeah, I, I imagine this. And uh, uh, speaking about imagination, I even imagine that uh, academia will be using Aqua because uh, uh, it makes a very natural and easy transition from running a distributed algorithm uh, in a simulation uh, to actual production systems because you have just library which is pluggable and it is pluggable uh, with regards to I don't know failover strategies as well and if you're as a scientist as a researcher made something dirty uh, not uh, catching all the errors and so on, it's absolutely okay. It would be still easy to fork it and fix it and uh, provide like uh, all the all the pieces. Cool. Do you have um, an example of some aqua that we could look at just briefly, just, just so that we have like a concrete idea of what it looks like? You don't have, even have to walk through it, but. Uh, yeah. We can, uh, one option is to open the Aqua book and take a look on uh, uh, something, I don't know, execution flow. And all of this stuff is on fluence.network, right? You're just looking at public It's uh, mainly fluence.dev. So all oh, the documentation yeah. is fluence.dev. Okay. Uh, so, oh, you still see another tab. Okay. Uh, language execution flow parallel it looks something like like this so you have for example a cycle or the peers peers are uh, the least and uh, you get uh, through this cycle actually in parallel for example Cool. You have yeah, uh, the limitations. Issue. You mentioned that it's a brand new language and no one knows it, but at least it looks very familiar to people who are doing maybe functional programming. Yeah, uh, there are some very special things. For example, uh, the on expression, which moves execution somewhere. So, for example, this will be executed on peer B. Mm -hmm. Uh, core means that it will be executed in parallel, so we just have a kind of coroutine. Join means that we are waiting for A and B to be executed and available. So we have these names uh, in terms of PyCalculus. We define them and then we are waiting. And we are, where, where we are waiting for them uh, on the execution side of this function. So nice. Uh, Let's get back. OK. So uh, this means that while in uh, the blockchain you have a consensus uh, built in, and if you want to have something beyond consensus, it might be a new business of uh, running something, uh, like a read model with uh, five independent companies providing uh, the peers for this read model, for example. It might be a business. Influence, it's uh, pluggable, and even consensus is pluggable. Uh, 
uh, pluggable means that you need to have it in Aqua and uh, employ where you need it. Uh, yep, 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 yep. But if you want cloudless functions to be useful, uh, if you want them actually to do something, anything, uh, then uh, you need to delegate uh, compute, actual compute or accessing data or changing the state or something like that to compute functions. And compute functions are uh, the functions which are located some code, actually the code that can be addressed uh, using uh, Aqua. Uh, so they're, using they're actually the implementation. Um, it's sort of like calling a method an object-oriented language, and this is the implementation of it, right? Exactly. Yeah. So cool. fundamentally, Aqua uh, has this uh, foreign function interface, and uh, uh, Aqua execution, like, yes, Aqua is a distributed language in runtime and so on, but finally, uh, everything is executed on a particular silicon, uh, and uh, uh, Aqua execution Every, every step ends up with uh, some definitions of what code with what arguments should be executed locally or what other peers uh, the current state should be forwarded to. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, actually, Aqua doesn't care about uh, the runtime. It uh, can be different runtime. For example, we have the Fluence JS client and it just calls whatever you provide as it just uh, callbacks and uh, for example we have a, a, a kind of a decentralized uh, chat uh, example where you have uh, uh, some state for the chat room as a, a fluent subnet as a replicated deployment uh, and you have uh, a clients clients go to the subnet they reg register themselves and then the cloudless function, the flow uh, can get to the subnet and then to all the peers who are listening to this topic. And mm -hmm. then the, the function is executed like show the next message. Oh, wow. So you're actually using, in that case, you're using the uh, the Aqua language and VM to route data that users would see in, in a distributed compute situation. And that's yeah. where, where the CRDT thing comes in that you were talking about for state replication and changes. Yeah, um, and uh, uh, actually we have uh, uh, different ways to trigger the cloudless function execution. And uh, 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 one is uh, trigger it from, from the client, which means that you have some kind of a light node, uh, light peer, and uh, it's light because no one else can deploy a function on it, deploy a compute function. So it's your own, uh, it's isolated. It could be uh, written in some native code, in the JavaScript or Rust. Uh, and uh, uh, one way is to create a request locally and send it to the network. Uh, another way is uh, uh, we have cloudless scheduler concept so uh, the peers on the network can be instructed to react on some event, for example, time ticker, uh, to trigger some function. And we are using it, for example, to pull uh, events from uh, the blockchain. So we have a function that periodically asks a service, uh, like, do you have any events? Do you have new events? And if uh, there are new events, then it can uh, do either some local configuration or it can deliver this data from the events to other peers because it's cloudless function. Cool. So it's like a distributed or decentralized cron. Yeah, yeah. Kind of, sort of. Uh, that's a very good analogy. Decentralized cron. Someday, no one will know what cron is. So that analogy probably doesn't work much longer. <laughs> Sometimes I realize I'm really old and I use the wrong analogies for young people. Oh, uh, really? Last time I used cron, it was like more than 10 years ago. 
Yeah, I just realized it. Wow. <laughs> uh, so uh, speaking about compute functions, uh, yes, you can run any uh, any code, uh, and you have it addressed, and you have execution routed to the peer uh, using Aqua and uh, Cloudless functions, and then it's a kind of a foreign function interface uh, to trigger some execution. But if you want your code to be uh, deployed on the hardware that someone else operates, uh, there must be some special limitations to the code that you provide. It cannot be any code because it's not safe, not portable, uh, and it's dangerous for the compute provider. So uh, to address this limitation, we have the default runtime. The default runtime uh, on Fluence is called Marine, and it's uh, based on the WebAssembly execution. So we have ma Marine implementation for the web browser and Marine implementation for Rust and for uh, JavaScript CLI as well, and for Electrum probably as well, uh, like mm -hmm. JavaScript. Uh, and uh, um, yes, it executes WebAssembly just like any other runtime does, but it uh, offers two special capabilities. Uh, one capability is uh, module linking. So if you have um, some reusable piece of code, uh, you can reuse it with the linking as a WebAssembly binary like you do with, I don't know, DLLs, or is it also a bad analogy? I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah. And uh, it means that if you have some uh, service, uh, some piece of code, like some compute function uh, that was written and it all, almost fits your needs, you can add a new module on top of it and reuse all the other mod modules. And uh, uh, another capability is that uh, Marine is the first runtime, uh, the first WebAssembly runtime that uh, uh, implemented uh, WebAssembly interface types. Mm -hmm. So uh, usually in WebAssembly, you can uh, pass through this uh, WebAssembly boundary only the primitive types like uh, numbers and that's all. Mm -hmm. uh, with uh, Marine, uh, you can pass structures, arrays, strings. Uh, that's enough, probably. Yeah. Which yeah, helps with so user defined structures, so you you have uh, more rich type systems and therefore better better interfaces between. The yeah. Functions. Yeah, and it works both with uh, uh, JavaScript and uh, uh, inside Rust. Uh, so if you want to have some code that uh, compute providers will run, then you need to use WebAssembly in the form of uh, Marine modules because it's uh, safe and it can be sandboxed. It can be isolated and can be uh, isolated in terms of resource consumption. So providers are ready to sell capacity to provide capacity for these kind of uh, uh, compute functions. And uh, uh, for uh, some use cases, you can even um, avoid the, the need to touch Rust and to make the, the service because we have some services uh, or other developers can provide some services uh, which solve uh, fundamental problems uh, that you may face. And if your problem uh, can be decomposed into these uh, fundamental or not that fundamental problems, then you're uh, nice with the test using what already exists. And one of the use cases uh, is a, a spell. Spell is a special service that has a local key value store. And if you think, what can be done with a distributed execution and a local key value store, then actually that's a lot. It's right. enough to make many things. 
So is spell something that the Fluence team created? Yes, spell is what Fluence team created. Uh, it's uh, um, a very special service because it has a key value store. That's OK. For key value store, it uses SQLite, actually, mm -hmm. uh, which is a module that's reusable. You can use it uh, on your own. Uh, but also, it has a connected uh, Aqua script. So it's uh, a script that has a, an exclusive access to service. And it's a service that has some access to the script. Mm -hmm. So it's a part of protocol. So this this excites me because it sounds like you're creating the the first real concept of a standard library of executable functions deployed onto the web. Does that make sense? So sort of like the C standard library exists for Unix or or even Windows, or <clears throat> then you would have all as 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 developers create more and more building blocks that maybe they're using for their own code. You could create reusable things with published APIs that others could just piece together. Yeah, this uh, reusability uh, plays a crucial role in uh, the overall uh, protocol design and uh, uh, the design of our tooling. Uh, it's made to help you create reusable code and to reuse the code that was already created. And also, you can reuse the deployed code. You can find the code that, that's already deployed and uh, uh, at least try to interact with, with it. Uh, and uh, uh, we have several examples like that. For example, we have, oh, I will tell about it later. So we have some special services, special modules, uh, and we have uh, um, some more for notation of reusability. But finally, it gets into two pieces. Uh, one piece is how compute uh, function is described. And for that, we have a very, very standard WebAssembly format with uh, uh, WebAssembly interface types, which is also a part of a standard. Mm. Uh, and module linking is also a part of it. Be, it's becoming a part of a standard. And we have uh, the type definitions on the Aqua level. So when you have a module uh, compiled using marine uh, tooling uh, from any language, uh, then you can uh, generate aqua typing from it. But actually, you can create aqua typing for any native code as well. And uh, having these types is enough to bring your compute uh, to distribute workflow. Or differently speaking, I uh, yeah, I believe it's uh, pretty important that it means that for any developer, uh, in order to make some piece of code, some service available for decentralized execution, it's enough to make one single module that exposes uh, these uh, capabilities to the cloudless functions. Amazing. My mind is racing with possibilities now. Cool. Awesome. But uh, actually, for that, uh, we need to touch man's defects uh, concept because without it, uh, there is a one small problem. Like I, I like the statement that uh, functions are either pure functions or useful. Pure <laughs> function that has no effect is useless. You cannot like it makes nothing. So finally, uh, this sandboxed, isolated, secure and safe module needs to do something. And right. uh, it needs yes. to interact with the outside world. So it's like, yeah, you. I've been itching to ask this question because this is where all the unsafe stuff happens, right? It's very easy to create a distributed system for calling pure functions. And pure functions are those with no side effects. Uh, well, and like I you said, not useful. Very... I doubt it's very easy. Okay, it's, it's, it's relatively easy <laughs> compared yeah, to... It's relatively easy. With... And uh, actually, blockchain is uh, pure in terms of, like, it has access to internal state. It makes the new internal state and nothing else. Uh, mm -hmm. Because uh, uh, in order to have all the peers the same and all the state transitions the same, you 
need to have the same state and you cannot access anything else mm -hmm. but like in the clouds uh when you have something real something that feels like a user facing product you actually cannot be limited to just one state machine uh actually if if it's a user facing product probably it has many services inside many cloud services or like managed services and in a, a decentralized space we have an analogy uh, for uh, managed services it's protocols but every protocol has a, like it has some security model it has some uh, capabilities like what exactly you can do in this uh, protocol in this network um, and it has uh, some client code and, and so on and so forth but usually it ends up when you want to make a user facing product with a, a, the decision how you want to use all of them like or many of them or mm -hmm. some of them and actually something custom uh, some custom code that you want to host yourself and usually uh, you have only two two choices one choice is to run your own uh, backend node and uh, it it's centralized or uh, you have another point of centralization inside your web browser that has all the SDKs of different networks, many keys. Um, it could be quite complex to manage all of this. So it uh, feels the same like it was uh, when you already have the cloud serverless services, but you don't have this serverless to, to connect the dots uh we already have this infrastructure but no way to make a product out of it uh, at least decentralized so uh that means that to make cloudless functions uh useful in addition to uh sandbox it uh, compute functions we also want to have uh, uh, some effects and ideally we want to uh, lift what other teams are doing and not try to conquer the world alone but instead uh, leverage these capabilities of different wonderful protocols that we already have or maybe we have two services that we already have uh, because that's how real world evolves uh, on the shoulders of giants or how it mm -hmm. sounds so but it contradicts with the safety and portability requirements and that's why we have matched fx approach so the idea is that uh, inside marine modules uh, you can have uh, uh, foreign function execution code like you can call foreign functions but uh, these uh, uh, functions goes to a special section of WebAssembly and uh, the peer that is going to host the module will see what exactly you want to call. And uh, uh, in order to uh, make it safe for a compute provider uh, to call this or that effect, uh, you need to know what's inside this WebAssembly module. So uh, it's possible to make um, a WebAssembly module uh, that is useful for developers on its API as a part of a service using linking, module linking. Mm -hmm. But it's safe for a compute provider uh, to provide it. So uh, we have effector modules which encapsulate effects inside and they need to be whitelisted by the compute providers uh, so that they are sure that using this effector is safe for the compute provider. Uh, and uh, uh, developers can use any effector modules uh, and guard them, hide them behind the facade module 
so that if you have, for example, uh, an, uh, I don't know, a Postgres uh, effector, why not? You might provide a Postgres database direct access. Mm -hmm. Then it's still safe uh, for the developer to the extent uh, of uh, the business logic that the developer provides. But even if this logic is incorrect, compute provider is still safe in terms of like no private keys are leaking uh, because like this effect can be isolated and it can be audited. The, the code can be audited of the effect module. And it makes uh, Fluence a kind of a, a Swiss army knife uh, to integrate different networks, protocols, services, uh, solutions, uh, which might or might not be uh, an easy fit for uh, decentralization otherwise. Right. So uh, how do how do the audited modules, like what would be the curation of these modules then? Because you say they can be audited so the compute providers can trust them. And of course, that's because you can't have just totally unmanaged code running on your, your server that might do anything. Um, so someone would audit it. And then what is, is there some sort of certification thing? Is there a trustless process now or in the future that you imagine for curating these modules? Uh, well, we, we uh, do not prevent any flow uh, on the protocol level, mm -hmm. but we provide uh, uh, the uh, compute providers with uh, the means to uh, enable this or that effector. So uh, there is uh, a positive incentive for compute providers to provide more uh, widely used or more custom effectors because uh, they are advertised on compute marketplace. Mm -hmm. and until you advertise it explicitly, uh, the protocol will not allocate uh, the code to your peer if it needs this effector, which means that the developers are incentivized to reuse effectors which are already present, and the compute providers are incentivized to deploy uh, and provide effectors which get traction. Right. Cool. That's interesting. It's, it creates uh, like network slash economic effects that, that exist already in open source, but in a more intense way because there's a marketplace attached to it and an actual execution environment. Yeah. And uh, uh, for the effectors for these modules, uh, like some effects uh, have a, a cascading effect on uh, the capabilities that they enable. For example, we have an uh, uh, IPFS uh, client binary. So with the IPFS effector, you can do data transfer from peer to peer, for example, uh, because with Aqua it's inefficient, Aqua is for control plane. You can build data plane with the uh, IPFS that comes out of the box. Uh, you can uh, use CIDs, IPLDs and such things. Uh, we have a ceramic effector, uh, which uses CURL effector. And CURL is just enough to call uh, HTTP or HTTPS, like any URL. So having just these effectors, we have a, a WebSocket effector in mind uh, to enable mm -hmm. subscriptions. And uh, uh, a very small number of uh, the main uh, effectors would be enough to provide developers a lot of flexibility. But if it's not enough, then speaking about st standardization, uh, actually this uh, calling the effect is uh, uh, just uh, calling the host functions from the web assembly. And finally, uh, this means that if you have any API and you want it to be um, like, that's about the use cases of WebAssembly in general. There could be different use cases. We can make uh, blockchains enabled by WebAssembly, or we mm -hmm. can do edge compute enabled on WebAssemblies, and so on and so forth. But uh, one other usage is uh, to uh, 
use WebAssembly for data marshaling and uh, for making different APIs of different languages, not that well standard standardized uh, and portable as WebAssembly, to make it available for uh, interoperation, interoperability, uh, just lift this API. Mm -hmm. So, so like creating uh, pre-deployed WebAssembly wrappers for APIs that don't already exist for WebAssembly. Yeah, and once it's done, it means that you can reuse some like uh, fault tolerance, for example, on top of your API out of the box using mm -hmm. Aqua. These calling yeah. strategies, like um, in different languages, these concepts are reintroduced again and again. You have a new API, you need to have a new SDK. In this SDK, you need to have some configuration. And then the new framework appears. You have different configuration for the same API. You have a new SDK, a new language. SDK is only for the old language, and so on. So uh, I believe that uh, we might be much more productive as developers uh, if we use the common format for uh, describing the API access to any external services. And I think WebAssembly is a very good fit. So uh, I agree. You mentioning IPFS reminded me of something. Um, you know, like when you deploy uh, a compute function, if someone starts reusing it and then you change it, uh, I believe you've thought about this already and, and you're not like compiling things in just by function name or version. Um, is it true that, that the compute functions end up being content addressed in the same way that, that IPFS is, or that you're like, you're really like building in a, a link to a hash as opposed to a name. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, it makes, um, uh, the, the, the answer is, uh, both yes and no. Why? Yes. Um, we have the concept of uh, cloudless deployment. Cloudless deployment is a description of uh, uh, the compute functions and uh, uh, the, the, the setup of a cloudless scheduler that you have, and also like uh, how many instances you want to deploy and such things. But mainly it's a description of services, functions, uh, and uh, uh, the scripts that you want to deploy. And uh, these uh, compute functions are made with the uh, IPLD and mm -hmm. they are uh, the part of the compute marketplace. So you can find the code, you can find the subnet, the deployments that uses this or that module if you like. So in, in this sense, the uh, subnet is content addressable, uh, where the content is what's being executed or used inside uh, the code. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, and it, it could help. For example, um, if we get back to this uh, imaginary, but I think it should be uh, implemented uh, one day by some company. Uh, example of this uh, decentralized chat on top of Fluence then we can have a chat room as a subnet that holds uh, the state of this room and uh, uh, the member list, such things. Um, but it makes all the rooms discoverable through the marketplace because they share the same... Um, actually, you, you even don't need to have the same services. You just need to have the same facade module because if you have the same facade module, then it means that you have the foreign function interface to your compute functions, which is the same, which is compatible with uh, uh, everything else, mm -hmm. which means that you can make the protocol out of this, out of APIs, which are discoverable on, on, on the marketplace. But uh, even if the uh, code is the same, or if it has the same uh, API, uh, the, the state, of uh, running code might differ. So in this sense, it's not content addressable and different deployments of the same code has different 
uh, identifiers uh, and uh, different life cycles. So the owner of the subnet, if I deployed something, then uh, it's my uh, responsibility, for example, to decide, do I want to update my code or not? Do I want mm -hmm. to redeploy it or not? I see. Cool. That makes pragmatic sense. So I, I see we're at the outro, which maybe means we're at the end of what we want to talk about today. Um, was there anything else that you want to, to cover? Well, um, I can show uh, some lines of code, of aqua code, to uh, maybe share the feeling of what it looks like in, yeah. in a more pragmatic sense. If it... Great. Yes, please. Uh, let me share VS code, VS code. All right. We have a language plugin only for the VS code so far. Uh, as long as I can use Vim mode, I'm okay with it. Uh, do you see it? No, not yet. I don't see shared screen yet. Uh, give me a minute. Okay. See, this is where I should have some jokes prepared. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess it's right in, in five minutes. Yeah, uh, I can show it on uh, GitHub because it's on GitHub okay. but without uh, the. Uh, Highlighting. Okay. No good highlighting. I guess it's no longer a thing to ask people if they're uh, VI or Emacs users. Everyone's a VS Code user. Ah, uh, uh, yes, here it is. Here it is. So uh, that's uh, the first. Aqua framework uh, that I'm working on uh, last days. Uh, and it hides some complexity to make the simple building blocks for the developers. So that's just an example of what it might look like uh, if you're going to use, if you're going to make your cloudless function. Probably you should begin with this as as a, an example, as a uh, like template. So once you deploy uh, the code, you get a deal on the chain and a subnet of chain. So you need to get it from your configuration. Then you can make a logger. Okay, that's nice. Uh, then uh, you need to make um, results variable. So uh, the issue is that right now, Aqua has no uh, generic types. Uh, it's planned, but right now it's not there yet. Mm -hmm. So for the particular type that you want to get, uh, you need to make a variable. And uh, uh, star here means that it's an append only CRDT stream. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you make a compute function. Compute function contains from uh, consists of contains. I don't know the start and the yield. Start means that I'm going to be on this worker. Worker is your piece of uh, uh, the peer uh, that has all the services that you deployed available. So here I want to run my service and uh, write the output to my variable. So it just does something. OK. Mm -hmm. And we have yield. Uh, yield is a function that waits for the result. So here we are waiting for at least one response in the result stream. It's not absolutely correct. It will be improved because we need to wait for uh, the response for this particular worker. But that's the idea. I'm joining on the variable to wait uh, for the response and to yield the result. So now I created the compute function. And then I can make a cloudless function. 
uh, here cloudless make. And I have different builders for the cloudless function. I can make a simple cloudless function, uh, which works like the following. I'm connected to one peer, and I trust this peer to make the route to my subnet, only one peer. Mm -hmm. Or I can use disjoint paths in parallel and uh, reach to my code using many, many disjoint paths. Here, I know only one peer. It's uh, the peer that I'm connected to, so it's still one peer. Actually, they are the same, but that's the concept. Mm -hmm. I can provide some context, and I uh, uh, pass the logger and the compute function as the context. And I have the yield function here. The yield function, cloudless yield, uh, expresses how I differentiate success of this uh, cloudless execution from the failure. And this means that I'm waiting for what happens first. If uh, uh, I have uh, uh, this success response, then just one, then it's a success. And mm -hmm. when the first response is failure, then it's a failure. It can be something different. It could compare the results. It could be like uh, in, in, any of that. But like that's how it's built. Uh, what I want to show here is that Mm -hmm. You can build the compute function, then you can build the cloudless function, you can build the yield uh, expression, and then you can use the executor. Uh, and here we have round trip executor that actually routes the code to your subnet. And only here you have something happening. Before that, you have configuration, you express what you want to execute, and here you execute in it. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can have round trip, but you also could have uh, far and forget behavior. And in this case, the yield functions will not be executed, and uh, uh, the request will never get back to you, which might be quite good. It might be what what you actually want. Right. It would only make sense in the case of something where you want to have some effect take place from the compute function, uh, yeah, like a side effect, right? Yeah. Cool. Uh, and yep, uh, then if we have some errors, uh, there is a convention that if we have errors here, then uh, it's a failure. We can uh, print it to console, for example. And if everything is OK, we are providing the response. So 100 lines. If you imagine how many things uh, happen here, that's a lot uh, mm -hmm. and uh, any comments. This is what uh, practical Aqua looks like uh, right now. Cool. Very exciting. OK, so now I want to go do stuff. Um, so and I'm sure someone else that's watching this will also want to do stuff. What, what should we do? Where should we go? And how do we learn how to get started? Uh, you should go to fluence.dev and get to the build section. Uh, here we have overview, how to set up your environment, quick start, examples, guides. And uh, for Aqua and Marine, we have dedicated books. So this is the main source of knowledge. And if you have any questions, as you probably know that documentation is usually kind of behind what's available right now, then you can get to our Discord. It's fluence.chat. So, uh, on the Discord, uh, we're always happy to answer any questions, to help you with anything and things like that. Great. Well, thank you very much. This is, uh, I'm, I'm not just saying it. This is very exciting to me. I've been waiting for something like this for a long time. So uh, I, I can't wait to build something with it. And thanks for taking the time. Thank you for having me here.